This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review and it's alien head time. So this is the Alienware M15. We reviewed the very first generation of this design which had NVIDIA GTX graphics and they refreshed it to RTX earlier in 2019 like everybody else who makes a gaming laptop but they didn't send them out for review. I think they're waiting for these interesting display options and really the focus of this review is going to be exactly the 4K OLED display inside. We're going to look at it now. So that OLED display, let's talk about that a whole lot, right? So we haven't seen OLED display in a laptop for a couple of years. For a while, Samsung was like, well, we don't know if we're going to be making the displays for laptops anymore, these OLED displays, but now they're back. And they say they're going to make 13, 14, and 15 inch size OLED displays for laptops. Again, witness the 15.6 inch display in this, which is a 4K, so it's high resolution, and it's OLED. It is not a touch screen. We haven't seen an OLED display in an Alienware since the Alienware 13, so it's nice to see it back again. Now, one of the reasons that you might want to buy a Dell, what the attraction is, is notice I say buy a Dell because Dell owns Alienware and they have bought them more than a decade ago. So you get that scale of manufacture that gives you basically lower pricing and a whole lot of configuration options. You can go anywhere from a 1660 Ti card all the way up to an RTX 2080 Max-Q card, all sorts of different storage options and four different display options. So. That's the plus with that. And we'll talk about the other display options a bit as well. Um, you also get a little bit that Alienware DNA is still here because they do operate fairly independently. They're still located in Miami where Dell is headquartered in Austin. So you get things like that unique design. Uh, some of the touches that Alienware does, like the Tron lighting on the casing and the Alien head logo that lights up and that sort of thing. So there's our little white shoes of Dell over the other gaming laptops that are out there. That said, Dell was late to the game with the thin and light or sort of thin and light gaming laptop thing. MSI had their Stealth Thin series, Asus had the Rogue Zephyrus, you get the idea. So what they do differently here is a bit beefier chassis. So for those of you who want something that's fairly portable but is not going to be like super ultra, scares you, flimsy, delicate, that sort of thing. That's what they're about. In theory, it should give you room for a little bit something better or extra. And one of those better extra things is the 90 watt hour battery, which you'll get as long as you don't choose the hard drive. So if you're thinking about going budget and choosing the hard drive and putting your own SSDs in later, don't do that because then there's not enough room for the bigger battery. You'll get a 60 watt hour battery if you get the hard drive option. But 90 watt, watt hour battery, that's one of the biggest batteries you're going to find in a gaming laptop. But what they didn't find a whole lot of extra room for in here is cooling. The cooling is pretty much average. Oh well. In terms of specs and options, you can see them on screen. To sum it up quickly, you have a Core i7 and a Core i9 option. A Core i9 is $396 extra. I say don't do it. This is already a thermally challenged machine. The Core i9 is only going to throttle more and that's a lot of money to spend for not a huge jump in performance. You can get this with NVIDIA 1660 Ti graphics, like I said, if you want to go with the low end, starts around $1,150 this machine, and that's with the 1660 card, not with an RTX graphics card inside, and with the Core i5, that's the other CPU option that you can get. If you get something a little bit more desirable, like what you would like to have, well, but you're talking, well, our machine with an OLED display, which is a $308 option, is around $2,400 with a Core i7, a 512 gig NVMe SSD, and 16 gigs of dual, dual channel DDR 2666 megahertz RAM. In terms of performance, uh, this review, uh, Dell started their review program late. Uh, <laughs> you're already going to know what the performance is like. If you've watched our other NVIDIA RTX gaming laptop reviews, it sits right where you expect it would for our configuration, which has an RTX 2070 Max-Q card. So if you're going with the 2080 or the 2070, those are the Max-Q variants. The 2060 is not a Max-Q. So it's a bit lower power. You're still talking a 90 watt power envelope for the GPU. It's not too bad. And they give you a lot of headroom there, a little bit of GPU overclocking in the Alienware command center. Thermals on this, frame rates are great, like I said. Thermals on this, eh, the core temperatures on ours, we're hitting 99 Celsius, and 100 is the allowable max. It's going to start throttling to start controlling things, so that's not super great. I know there's a variation with these machines. Some people get some that are better, some people get others that run hotter, but overall they do seem to run on the hot side. So 
happily, there's a big enthusiast community. A lot of people buy these Alienware, so there's a whole lot of talk about how you can repaste it. It is very easy to get inside to repaste it. You probably do want better thermal paste. You probably do want to consider things like undervolting the CPU, which is a very easy way to drop 5 to 8 degrees centigrade and get better temperatures. The surface temperatures on this are pretty good, especially considering the fact that this is a metal casing laptop, so that does transfer heat. So it's not that it's going to burn the hair off your legs, really. We just worry about the CPU use health and longevity and how much throttling is going to happen here. Ports on this pretty much unchanged from the last generation that we reviewed. It's nice to see we get things like Ethernet on board. Now we have Thunderbolt 3, which also does USB-C and the usual Alienware graphics amplifier, three USB type A ports, both DisplayPort and HDMI 2.0 on this. So yeah, it's, it's nice to see that we've got a healthy selection of ports, despite the fact that this is a relatively compact chassis. The keyboard hasn't changed from the previous generation, and I still like it. It has a reasonable amount of travel, very nice tactile feel. It's zone backlit, not per key RGB backlighting still. I know that's going to be hurt for some of you. And it's a Microsoft Precision trackpad. It's a great trackpad. As with the first generation of this design, this has stereo speakers that are down firing towards the front, and they're okay sounding. They're not as wildly impressive as the bigger chassis alien, whereas which, well, that's not surprising, smaller chassis, smaller speakers. So let's talk a bit more about that OLED display. And what we're going to do is play some actual recording of the unit playing game so you can actually see the display. We'll have a side-by-side -side with the Alienware M15 with the regular full HD IPS display so you can see the difference. And I'm particularly going to use Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which is in fact quite shadowy in some settings, particularly that oil fields area that you can play in. And we're going to use Resident Evil 2, which is your ultimate dark and spooky game, because OLED displays have perfect black levels, zero black. There is no backlighting. That's why each of the little OLED cells turns on and off and shows color. That's how you get brighter with an OLED display. So yes, it's pretty good if you want to do things like play games with dark settings, because you're going to not have as much crushing of the blacks, potentially. You'll see more detail, and what is supposed to be black is going to be black. There is no IPS light bleed here because it's not an IPS display and there is no backlighting. Those things are lovely. What isn't so fantastic is that there is no calibration from the factory for this. And oh my god, it's sort of like cliche OLED displays from several years ago, like you remember like a Samsung Galaxy S4 or something like that, where the colors were very garish and overblown. You can see the color accuracy graph where lower numbers or lower bars are better, and, and this is very blown out. So that means all of the colors are very accentuated. You'll see some blooming, particularly in the reds and the blues. What does that mean? Well, it still looks really pretty and really pops. And if you're just buying this display because you want really vivid, awesome, over-the-top colors, well, you are going to get that here. But if, for those of you who are content creators, you're doing photos, you're doing video, and you need the wider gamut for that sort of thing, particularly if you're working for print or for cinema, that sort of thing, this is not at all a color accurate display. And sometimes it can be really hard, actually, to use a colorimeter to calibrate an OLED display correctly. So. I just wouldn't go there. If that's what you're looking for here, I would get a non-OLED alternative, basically wide gamut display if you really need color accuracy. It does represent all of sRGB and 99% of Adobe RGB, so we have plenty of gamut here. Uh, the gamma's a little high on it, but not horrible, and obviously the contrast ratio is just through the roof. I mean, this makes it very easy to read text. It's pretty bright. We measured 416 nits, and there's something about OLED, particularly these more garish, uncalibrated OLEDs, where it really does seem retina-burningly bright, so you probably are not going to want to run it at max brightness ever, unless you're outdoors. I could not see PWM. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist here. It's not uncommon with OLED displays, but it's probably in such a high range that neither our camera, which is our best tool for picking it up because we don't have an oscilloscope, and nor our eyes could actually see the PWM. So if you're worried about that kind of the, the display backlight flashing on and off, or in this case, the actual OLED cells turning on and off and bothering your eyes, it shouldn't be a problem here. Now, there are other display options, and, you know, they're actually mirroring Razer with the Razer Blade 15 with their display options, too. Besides the 4K OLED, the base one is a full HD IPS 300 nit display with the usual 75% of Adobe RGB and near full color 
coverage of sRGB. It's a competent display. And just like Razer Blade, they have a 240 hertz refresh full HD IPS display, which is a new thing on the market. And I would bet it's the same panel that the Razer Blade 15 uses. In fact, we will be reviewing that very soon. And we'll take a look at that display, but there just really aren't many panels on the market. And then if you like the Nebula red color and not the Epic Silver that we have here, then there's a regular 4K IPS display that's 500 nits. I don't know why the OLED display display is limited to the epic silver, silver chassis, but it is. The only drawback with the OLED display is that it has a fairly glossy covering on it, even though Dell describes it as anti-glare. And it really is noticeable, especially if you are playing games or, or movies with dark scenes, it can be a little hard to see beyond the glare. When it comes to battery life, it's usually a very good thing with Alienware. We have NVIDIA Optimus switchable graphics here, so it will use Intel UHD 630 integrated graphics if you're not doing something that's graphically demanding, if you're just watching streaming video, if you're working in an office application, the web, whatever, that sort of thing. And if you get the 90 watt hour battery, which is what we have, expect, relatively speaking, very good battery life from a gaming laptop. Now this one, when you're not gaming, just doing every, everyday productivity with brightness set to 150 nits, we've been averaging about six and a half hours. That's pretty darn good for a gaming laptop. It comes with a big footprint charger. Now we do have the RTX 2070 Max-Q, so it's going to get a bigger charger, and they actually give you a little room for some overclocking of that GPU and stuff. It's a 240 watt adapter. It's got quite the sizable footprint and quite the, the weight. You'll feel it when you carry that thing around, but happily, you might not have to take it everywhere. Opening up the M15 and the M17 is such a joy compared to the previous generations, the pre-M models, where it was a two-part affair to get to all of the internals. So you just unscrew the Phillips head screws. They're all readily visible here. There are also two on the back edge. Don't forget those. And the front ones are captive, which means they stay in place. Make sure you remove the others because otherwise they'll fall inside and get stuck to the magnets on the speakers. You can hear that. That's metal. That's nice stuff right there. Alrighty. And inside we have the, obviously, the preferable 90 watt hour battery. That's the one that you're going to want for better battery life, and that's the one you're going to get if you go with the SSD options. Only if you get that hard drive, like I said, then you'll get the 60 watt hour battery because there's just not enough physical room for a battery and a two and a half inch drive. So inside we have our two RAM slots. Ours is 16 gigs with dual channel. That's DDR4, 2666 megahertz, as you would expect. Here's our M.2 NVMe SSDs. Ours is a 512 gig Toshiba. Uh, the speeds, like you saw, are not super duper impressive on that, but it's decent enough. And they have a copper heat sink and some heat tape underneath it for cooling. Uh, honestly, with Alienware, the drives usually haven't run that hot. doesn't even need it that much, but it's nice to have. Second M.2 bay right here. So yes, you can have two drives. You can set up a RAID if you want. Woohoo! Two fans right over here as a standard for a gaming laptop. One for the CPU, one for the GPU, and the heat pipes over here. These are not the biggest, beefiest heat pipes, honestly, especially given the fact you could configure this with a Core i9 if you wanted, and an RTX 2080 Max-Q. Granted, the Max-Q version, but Cooling a little on the light side, it is still, real, relatively speaking, a thin and light laptop. They do have some constraints. They do cool VRMs and other components here. It's a fairly large plate, but uh, our thermals were not that good on it. I would say it's very easy to, now to access this stuff to repaste it. You might want to consider repasting it. This is our Killer 1550i Wi-Fi card here, which basically the hardware is an Intel 9560AC card, so that's good stuff right there. And then we've got our fin exhausts, which I believe are aluminum and not copper. It's a little hard to tell because they're painted black. So you've got exhausts on the rear and on the sides, which is always a brilliant idea. So that's the Alienware M15 with NVIDIA RTX graphics and Intel 8th generation CPUs. Like I said, I'm sure they'll be refreshing them eventually with 9th generation CPUs, but not a big performance leap there other than the improvement in Wi-Fi. The slimmer, lighter Alienware is a thing, and I do appreciate that, even if it's not as super light as like an MSI Stealth Thin or a Razer Blade 15. The cooling on is still, you know, it's for you tinkerers out there, and happily there's a large community of people sharing their results with doing repasting, underclocking, and all that sort of thing. Because the thermals are a bit toasty. The surface temperature is okay, but that OLED display, very pretty. Again, not for you con professional content creators because color accurate, it's not nearly that. But if you really like those super zingy colors, kind of like Samsung Galaxy phones from a couple of generations ago, man, are you going to get it here, along with that improved visibility in dark scenes when you're trolling those dungeons and gaming and all that sort of thing. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and thumbs up if you like this vid.